Hello and welcome to another tutorial by Renderosity on Poser 11 and Poser Pro 11. I'm Mark Bremer and in this movie we'll go through the physical surfaces as it relates to natural types of objects. I'm talking about stone, wood, plant materials. The difference between this tutorial and some of the others early on materials that are similar is that this is concentrating exclusively on the physical renderer and the Superfly render engine. I've already kind of covered how to build hybrid types of shaders. We won't be going over that here. And I'll also introduce you to some of the great time-saving tricks you can use when you work with this fantastic new ability for materials coupled with the Superfly render engine. So let's get going here. I do need to mention this is an advanced tutorial, so I'm skipping around a lot and not talking about how you go through basic things. If you're new to Poser and would like to learn more about that, Renderosity has two complete series about working with Poser from the ground level up. Please check those out. All right, there's some things in the scene here I want to point out. I'll be working with some texture-based, or I should say picture-based textures right here. You can do everything in the new physical renderer like you have done historically, only with less steps. I do want to introduce an idea or show you something that has kind of followed Poser around for a number of editions, and I have no idea why. I've got a large cloth plane in here. We've looked at this in some other movies, and if I flip over to uh, this little view, we can see it's made up of a bunch of squares. We've got a high-res sphere in here. We've got a cube that's also got a lot of uh, polygons in it. And then there's this thing. This square in the center happens to be the square right here. Why am I mentioning that? Well, this one particular square, and this is what's followed Poser around for a while, is horribly UV mapped, meaning that when you use picture-based textures, they totally misalign, and you have to go through these little wonky types of uh, fixes to get it to work. Now, I've already loaded a texture in, so you don't have to see me go through those steps, because we'll see how it works correctly with all the other shapes. So if you start playing with primitives and working with it, I wanted you to know that there's this little weird thing that goes on that's not your fault. So let me go ahead and get back to our view here. I'll close up the, uh, well, let's just get rid of the library here. We don't really need that anymore, do we? Dock to close. Boom. So now we've got uh, a little more real estate to work right here. The first thing I'd like to do is mention that on our lighting controls here, I've stripped out all the lights and created a single spotlight that is pointing actually at this square. The reason for that is as I move around the scene, we'll be able to see the effects very closely, and I don't have to worry about uh, all the extra render time for additional lights. I do want to talk about lighting differently when you start getting into detailed types of renders with uh, very accurate or high resolution types of textures just so you know ways to start thinking about those scenes a little bit. The first thing I'll do is say hey let's uh, let's position it here so we can see that. Let's select the uh, cloth plane, go into the materials room and let's exit the materials room and go back in. Since I'm working on a smaller screen area right here it uh, well it does special things. Okay, now We've already covered in earlier lessons this year the differences between Firefly and Superfly. We can build hybrid types of shaders where you build a shader structure or material structure exclusively for Superfly, but then repurpose some of the assets for Firefly the way you've always done it for years and years. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that. We're just going to stick strictly with Superfly here. I will create a new node, root node, and physical surface. The biggest difference between physical surfaces, let me shrink this up, and yeah, I got rid of the, uh, the dock here. Let's get rid of that again. I won't let me go any smaller there. Oh well, here we go. The primary difference is that when I engage Superfly right here and begin working with it, depending on the render engine you have selected, it will choose either the physical surface node here or the poser surface with all the kind of different tricks you have to do to pull off the effects I'm going to do very easily with the physical surface here. So let's come back to the preview mode. In a little bit I think I'll go ahead and engage the ray trace preview. For now let's just go ahead and work with the standard preview because that will 
make some points very clear and we won't have to worry about the render time with the render or ray trace preview. Okay, what are we looking at here? This physical surface renderer is much more abbreviated than the first one. If I scroll this, we go all the way down and we can see all these extra items that are in here that are good, but they're kind of all built in and hidden inside of these other functions. Color here is equal to diffuse color in the, the actual Firefly root node. Let's go ahead and shrink this up and let's get rid of that. We'll just uh, move it off to the side here so we've got a little more playroom. All right, let's load in a new 2D texture. And something I need to mention is that when you're working with the physical surfaces, you're under no obligation to bring in any special functions out of cycles unless you want to. So what I'll do is come over to texture. I'll just come into image map just like you always would. And I've got uh, several kinds of textures. We'll work with a wood one first. It's been like it's dilapidated paint type of a barn wood thing. So let me track that down. All right, let's see. We'll go with wood right here. And you get a good sense of uh, what that looks like. Go ahead and open that up. Activate that. And as you always do, you just drag it over and connect it. Now we can see that there is kind of a darkness to it. The physical surface node does not come in with bright white in the color section. It comes in with a little bit of gray. If you want to increase that, certainly turn it to white and you'll see our texture get a little bit brighter right here. Let's talk about now the differences and let me swing the light around so you can see that a little bit better. See how shiny the floor is? We will be fixing that. And if I do a quick little area render, we'll see our, our worst dreams come true and the fact this doesn't look like wood whatsoever. The render settings just happen to be basic render settings right now, so know that. Since I moved the light, the material changed, so let's go back and select the floor, or the cloth plane as it were. Now since I'm lazy or efficient, what I like to do is get uh, settings all set up if I'm doing image map based textures on the first node. And that way when I go ahead and copy and paste this, it's already automatically pointing at the directory where I've got the other images. So I'll just go ahead and label this as, uh, well, image map, we'll just call this texture. And with that done, let me go through and explain some of these others. You've seen me in another tutorial explain the very odd way that the Firefly engine uh, works with transparencies. It uses opacity maps versus transparency maps, and the rest of the 3D world pretty much uses transparency maps. So now that that's here, you can choose between opacity and transparency, and when we get to the plant, we'll talk about that a little bit more. These other areas for roughness is kind of the level of reflectivity that the object does or does not have. Right now the roughness is set to 0.1, meaning it's pretty smooth, which is why we're getting this super high type of uh, value on the light. If I take this and crank it up to 1, it goes away, and if I do a quick area render, we'll see that we can see the floor. The basic render settings are making it look a little bit grainy right now, but really, really nothing special here whatsoever. Let me come back to the preview here and just scroll up a little bit so we can see that better. Let's create a little better lighting situation actually, so we can see more of what's going on. Now, let's go ahead and simply uh, copy and paste this. I'll roll that up real quick, copy and paste with the keyboard shortcuts. But this one we're going to go ahead and bring down into the roughness, or well actually I'll do it on the specular channel. We're going to control how much light with the roughness, or how rough the surface is, how metallic, if you will, it is, or kind of glass reflective with mirrors. But I want to control the highlights that come out of that. So let me spin this open. We'll go to wood. And this time what I'll do is say, let's grab a specular map. And you may be wondering, how do you get these normal maps, specular maps? I did create a tutorial about working with different programs to create all these out of photographic textures. So go ahead and hunt that one down and answer all your, your, your deep, dark questions about that. Let me bring that in. Texture, we'll plug this into specularity. As we look at this texture, 
everything that's white is going to have a brighter degree of reflectance when it renders. So we can go ahead, if we want to tone this down a little bit more, we can uh, change it darker to gray. It's not super bright right now. If I wanted it a little bit brighter, we could. If I go ahead and do a quick area render, well, notice nothing really has changed, and that's because there is no particular bump or normal map in place. There's no displacement to really leverage this. If we go ahead and roll that up, we could we could plug this into roughness right here and then let it do a little additional work. And if I go ahead and click drag through that, we see it thinking a little bit harder. What I'll do is say, you know what, I don't want it to be a completely rough, non-reflective surface, so let me bring this back for the sake of clarity to just half of that value. And when I render now through the scene here, we're still not seeing much. Well, let's make it so we can. Let me roll this up. I'll copy and paste. Let me actually call that spec and rough. Simple minds, I have to do that kind of stuff. In this case now, what we'll do is we'll bring in a normal map. I prefer to work with normal maps because they have higher degree of fidelity. They render faster than bump maps do. So I'll go ahead and disclose this. We'll choose the normal map for this texture. Bring that in. Yep. Now once this is loaded, you've got the ability to let it work at 100% or tone it back. Kind of depends on the scene and the lighting. Now that I've got the lighting activated, we can see, or I should say the normal map activated, we can see that it's really pushing the specular maps right here. And this is a case where I may want to say, you know, I don't want the roughness to be driven by the texture map, so I'll disconnect that. And we'll leave it at 0.5. For the sake of argument, let's re-render in this area. And we'll see it starting to have a little more believable type of behavior right there. If I wanted it to be a little more significant, I could bring that down to, say, 0.3 or 30% if you want to kind of get into the math of it all. And we're seeing it start to show up like it did earlier with that map. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this back to a value of 0.8. And as we introduce displacement into it, we'll start seeing the edges and everything working a little more clearly with that. Okay, let's do just that. Let me go ahead and name that normal. Why be normal, right? Copy, paste. Got our new one. I see I scrolled in there. Or something happened. We'll call this one displacement because, well, that's what it is. Oh, he can't type. Let's get this right. Open this up. And grab our displacement map, which in this case I called it a groove just because, well, that's what I did. I'll bring up the fact that displacement maps work best on high polygon objects. If I apply this displacement map to the single polygon square, you would see nothing happen, and you would think the program was broken. It's just that there's not enough information for it to do its job. So let me plug this into displacement, but I do need to give it a certain value. And the significance of this number is based upon your preferences and what scale you've chosen in there. So if we come to uh, interface, I've got mine set up at feet right now, but you can change it to whatever you would like to work with. So based on the size of the scene, the size of the planes that come in, just know that as I set the numbers, they're not numbers that you have to stick with if you've got these other options selected right here. Many folks like to work with the metrics because, well, it's awful easy to work with them and get senses of scale there. So with that in place, I've got that plugged into displacement, and I'm going to give it a value of something like, yeah, 0.2. And that's way too much. So let's bring it down to something more like 0 0.05, which makes a lot more sense. Click Return, do our area render. Now this is looking a little more believable, and that's still a little too aggressive. So let me go ahead and do 0 0.02. 
and it's nice because our shadows if I just do a full render right here our shadows follow the curves or the bumps of the ground right here if I happen to uh, take this light and move it back here a little bit more and we do a render we can definitely see the dimension quality to it right here so great um, learn that let's go ahead and select everything here I'm going to copy it and what we'll do now is select the sphere and paste this texture into the sphere okay if we render that now we'll see we've got uh, well it's a little difficult to see you're welcome let me move the slide over so we get a better sense of what's going on we can see we've applied all the displacement and everything to this ball and it matches up perfectly. The texture, the square of the texture is matching top to bottom just like it did on this plane. Let's talk about making some changes to the actual cloth plane right here in terms of substances. For displacement, let's go ahead and reload a different texture in here. In this case it's going to be a stone texture. So I've got kind of the groove which I use for the displacement. I'll choose open on that. We'll spin this up for the normal map. Let's load in the normal map for that as well. And you'll see that we can get these completely different effects with it, but then we're going to do something really cool with this when we get to the cube. So let me select this in the normal map. Pop that in. We're seeing it update in the preview just a little bit. The specularity, we'll grab that. And finally, we'll go ahead and grab the actual texture itself. And that's loaded in. So now we see it also matching up very nicely. If we do a quick render of the scene, we'll see that we are getting some nice kind of depth to this. It's a little bit rounded, a little bit um, maybe um, too much of a displacement there. So we can always go back in and make sure that all the settings are here in terms of strength of texture and just come back in here and go, you know what, this is just simply going to have to be 0 0.01 so it doesn't round up so much. If we wanted really crisp lines there, we would have to have a dense polygon mesh to pull that off. Let me render this again real quick with that change so we can see it. Much nicer to look at if I spin this light over back behind it and then we go ahead and render we'll see that we're getting some really nice type of effects here. So, let's relate this to how we can work with stone types of objects that may be a little bit polished by working with the cube right here. I'll leave the light back here and in fact, let me uh, point it around yeah, like this. Maybe down a little bit more. Okay. I'll come back to our cloth plane here and I'm going to capture all this and copy it. But I'm going to select the cube. We'll insert a new physical renderer. I should say physical surface technically. Enable Superfly and talk about something down here at the bottom. These are the subsurface scattering. You've seen me pull off all sorts of tricks with people and getting ears to illuminate by working with texture maps. With this capability now, you don't have to uh, do uh, all those little tricks. We'll deal with that in an upcoming tutorial, but I want to show you how it works with the physical renderer and solid objects. Now, if I do a quick render of this scene right here, and let me go ahead and zoom into this so it uh, fills up a little bit more of what's our previous screen. If I do a quick area render, you're going to see exactly what you expect. It's a gray box and it's picking up some of the color that's bouncing off the floor. It's doing everything it's supposed to. The subsurface scattering and conveniently SSS for subsurface scattering is for red, green, blue. These numbers relate to how far the light is allowed to go through an object before it kind of gets absorbed or the word is attenuate actually as it goes through. So let me say I want the red to go a distance of five feet before it fully absorbs into an object. 
With that done, if I go ahead and render real quick, we'll see that light is starting to show through the scenes. This is really nice when you're working with marble types of surfaces. So if I wanted to add a little bit of yellow to that maybe and make it uh, not quite so red, but you see the implications for working with ears or things like that on people, fingers that may be backlit, something like that, pretty cool stuff. Let me go ahead and just enter a value of something like 3. I think that will work out. We'll do a quick render again and see if we've tempered this just a little bit. Eh, it's getting a little more purple. Bring in 2 in the green. Render. Getting a little more of the yellow type of reddish as it was going through minerals. Why am I doing this? Because what I want to do then, that I've got the subsurface scattering the way I want it, is that I can go ahead, paste into the scene, and it paste this other node that we were using for the stonework on the floor. Why is this important? Well, see the subsurface scattering? I want to remember those values and simply enter them here. Five, two, and four. All right, we've got that. But when I render this up, we'll see something interesting. And that is uh, Poser blows apart uh, primitive shapes like this that aren't connected truly on the edge. We can kind of see into the cube. So what I'll do is disconnect displacement. That's no longer there. A new render now gives us something that looks much more like marble and we get some light bleeding through on the edges like we would with actual stone. So there's a way to work with polished stone as compared to unpolished stone which happens to be on the floor itself. All right, last little uh, trick here as we're working with this. Let's look at working with plant surfaces and transparencies with the physical renderer. I'll select the plant that I've got loaded in there, and uh, let's zoom in on that just a little bit. A quick render will go ahead and show you what that's looking like now. Um, black, yeah. Well, let's see how we fix this. What I want to do is bring up the physical renderer that I've got in there, but I haven't added all the different little things we we'll want to be doing to work with it. Hey, aren't we getting some nice light right here in this cube? Looking pretty cool. I'm going to have to give it a higher uh, render setting so we can see that when we're done here. Okay. Sounds like I'm talking to myself, right? We've got our image source of the leaf. So let's talk about this transparency thing right here. This node right here, and we'll simply call this one texture. pointing at the directory. Look at the scaling that's going on. Remember at the very beginning I'd mentioned that this one single square has a terrible UV map. To get this shape to fit, I've had to, even with auto fit selected, it doesn't work. So I've had to go ahead and scale it on the U scale, half of the size, less than half the size on the V scale, and then I've had to offset it to get it to center back onto the square itself know that that is not your problem. It happens to be a problem with this one piece of geometry. Okay, that's done. Let me copy and paste this in here. This is going to be our transparency. We'll load a new map in. Leaf transparency, just what you see black and white. Earlier on with the Poser Pro 2014 series, I had shown a trick to go ahead and get transparency maps to actually invert and work with that. If you don't have Poser Pro 11 on Poser 11, you can go consult that and see how to work with transparency maps inside of Poser then. So just wanted to mention that little detail. So I'll plug this in to transparency. Now if we come over here to preview, nothing's changed we need to assign a value or strength of this, zero being nothing and one meaning everything. Suddenly the background drops away. That's kind of nice. Now it's set to opacity now. If I go to transparency, watch what happens. It inverts. So this mode right here goes ahead and swaps back and forth. These texture maps that you had to do kind of complex uh, hoop jumping and build all these little hacks to make it work. So I'll switch it back to opacity, but know that that's no longer needed. Pretty cool stuff. The roughness is set to 1. 
If I do a quick area render right here, we'll see that we don't have any highlights. And I actually kind of want highlights in here. Let me close this up. And I'll copy this. But I'll close this. Let's get our normal map in here so we can start working with that. I'll paste this, name it normal, and load in the normal map. Shazam. And we'll give this a strength you know, a little more aggressive, something like 0.5. Let's go ahead and do an area render. And we don't see a big change right there simply because we've got this low resolution type of uh, render going on. Let me go ahead and render the scene up just a little bit. I'll select this again, come back to preview, and check our settings out because I'm expecting a brighter highlight than what I'm getting. And maybe the specularity needs to come up to a brighter white. And the roughness may be a little too strong. Let's dial this back down to something like 0.6. So I did two things at once, kind of a no-no, so I can't keep track of exactly what made it look right. Ah, much better. The highlight is that lighter green, giving it a little higher sheen the way leaves have, is bringing up some of these highlights just the way I want it. So if we zoom into this just a little bit, for the sake of clarity, and render this real quickly, We'll see now we're getting a very nice effect going on with the leaves looking quite believable. So let me back out of the scene just a little bit. And give you a good sense of what we've got going on right here. The textures you work with stone, you can control with the subsurface scattering how much light shows through them. So even for rougher stone, if it was uh, porous to a degree, but certainly if it's polished like a white marble, uh, that's getting close to the hard edge objects, but you can use the subsurface scattering to let light creep through the corners and kind of bleed out for the side. When you're working with transparencies now, we've got the option to work either with poser-based opacity maps or transparency maps from other programs and uh, invert and make those work. Always have to give them a value. And also working with displacement very easily inside of the program and simply assigning a value. That's very similar to the old poser surface but now we don't have to do any of these uh, math functions and import different stuff and all sorts of the tricks you used to have to work with before. It's just done simply well and better and you're going to love working with the program. Have fun!